July, it's Friday, the 10th of July, it's three o'clock. Welcome to Together Unlocked, the disability arts chat and a little bit of comedy show brought to you by Together 2012. I'm Jude Gosling, artist and artistic director of Together 2012. With me in my East London studio is our chair, the artist, Julie Newman and also currently one of the random animals that appear on this show, a small tabby called Jinx. We're going to go over to our West Midlands studio for some introductions and some audio description, and then we'll come back to us in East London. So on the other half of our virtual sofa is... I think I'd better go first before I get upstage. <laughs> so... Uh, hi, I'm Robin Sergina. I'm business director at Together. Um, I am also known as Angry Fish as an artist. Um, today I am sporting lovely grey white hair. Um, it was it's greyer than it was white the other day. No explanation as to why. Um, wearing uh, no rimmed silver armed glasses. I am sporting a deliberate shadow on the chin and neck, um, and then. Wearing below that, and I'll explain now. Um, I have been using lockdown, like many people, to actually try and get fitter. Um, and I'm wearing an outdoor kind of training top. And whilst I'm not going out, out after this, I'm going to go out to our garden and do some basketball pra ball practice with Emily as a good bit of keep fit. So I'm also wearing a um, short sleeved. Um, black over top, which is good for training outside, over a grey collared T-shirt. And may I ask, is this your dressing up to go out to stay in outfit? For anybody new to the show, on a Friday we dress up to go out but to stay in, which means it can be wholly imaginary, illusional, or um, indeed, as with Robin, are you dressing up to go out to stay in to exercise? I am indeed, yes. This is my dressing up to stay in to go out to the garden. <laughs> <laughs> that was clear as mud. So, <laughs> uh, And I am Josh Sergeant. I'm one of the hosts of Together TV. And I am a uh, doctoral research student uh, most of the time. And we're allowed to go and do some research. Um, I've got... Uh, swept over kind of medium length blonde hair and um, I'm wearing a kind of dark navy sports jacket with a light blue uh, with kind of white polka dots uh, shirt and then a pair of large uh, rimless mirrored aviators with silver arms um, because I am dressed up to stay out to go in no <laughs> dressed up to not do anything um not participating in sport uh, like Robin, but I am dressed up uh, as this weekend would be the Wimbledon finals. Uh, so I am attired appropriately for a nice uh, royal seat box to, uh, to watch some tennis over the weekend. Well, quite by coincidence, I'm dressed up to go out to stay in to see Wimbledon as well. But perhaps from a more, should we say, lowly seat, I have <laughs> a short corona crop self-administered short red hair i've got black rimmed glasses black wrist braces silver jewelry and i have a top that's a combination of a bright luminous yellow collar and sleeves it's got a pink back and it's got a bright turquoise front with some sort of light green floral designs. I have indeed worn this to Wimbledon in real life. We were talking on Wednesday about the ballot and I like to dress to match the tennis balls. I can see <laughs> you're very much part of the other school where, you know, in fact, all you need now to really fit into the cocktail bars is a Panama hat. So a Panama hat to you would be absolutely perfect. But I'm the... There's a jug of pims just out of shop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. But I'm the kind of person who takes in my picnic and, like I say, addresses to match the ball. So, Julie, what do you look like and where are you going? What do I look like today? Today I'm wearing a black uh, baseball cap with a peak. Uh, I have my, my usual... Um, gold and silver hair underneath peeping out. I have my dark rim glasses. I have a dark t-shirt with 
atomic -y things on it. And I'm carrying a sign that says End Racism. And today I'm going to Spielberg to this Digian Formula One Grand Prix to support Lewis Hamilton. Um, I'm deliberately doing that, uh, not because I like Formula One, which of course I do, um, and not because I support Lewis Hamilton, which of course I do, although obviously other drivers are available. Um, but it's simply because I think his stand in um, Black Lives Matter in, in Austria is particularly important. Uh, I went to a, a fundamental rights agency a conference there on the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities a few years ago. And although I'm used to being held up in airports, I got actually separated off from everybody else on the flight by two men carrying machine guns who separated me completely from my PA, from the rest of the passengers, um, and I honestly didn't know what was going to happen to me or indeed why I was being held under gunpoint. Eventually, I was the last person on the plane, um, which, again, isn't that unusual. Um, but it, 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 I think it, it demonstrated for me that although I'd been to uh, a conference on inclusion, a conference on the legal right for disabled people to participate in employment, etc., and independent living, um, the reality of that is very different. And I think for um, Lewis Hamilton in Austria uh, over this weekend, it's going to be very difficult for him. I think um, I suspect um, there's definitely some truth in that. I've performed in Austria doing spoken words, you know, specifically around disability issues, I think three or four times. And I've had some really mixed experiences, you know, with some absolutely lovely people, but also a great awareness that Central Europe have got very different standards to Western Europe. And Western Europe have got very different standards in terms of disabled people to the UK. So as soon as you get over to France, you're much more likely to be institutionalised as a disabled person. And by the time you get over to Austria, it's almost taken for granted. I know I've worked in Switzerland and what is also very true of the Austrian kind of model in terms of disabled people and the Swiss model is it's very much based on what they call the care model. So they believe that you deserve to be taken care of, you know, which is a rather different attitude to what we're used to coming across in the UK. But of course, that does also negate against you doing anything and um, I know one Austrian disabled artist who um, lives in this country was saying when she went back recently she was just asked well why don't you just give up and go into a home so I think there's a very different cultural attitude how that translates into attitudes towards race and culture I just don't know but I would be surprised if life wasn't quite difficult because like I say when you get to Central Europe it's a very different culture have you been swimming in those countries Robin yeah I mean I've um I swam at the European Swimming Championships in Vienna um and I guess you're kind of in a a, a bit of a rarefied atmosphere um I mean certainly throughout my swimming career I, I had a really good friend who was Austrian swimmer actually and and his mum was the coach of the Austrian team and they were really liberated. Um, and, and whilst yes, it wouldn't be my choice to live in a home. I do remember we, um, the, the accommodation for the swimming championships was in this incredible accessible Schloss or whatever they're called in Austria. I mean, this kind of, you know, a hundred bedroomed mansion that was an accessible home. Um, you know, if I had to go into a care home, I would be quite happy there. I mean, that's for sure. Let's put it that way. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's different. I mean, there are other places that we've been, you know, as swimmers where um, you you definitely feel, even though whatever the country is doing to put the event on, um, that, you know, people will cross the road to not walk next to you in case they catch something or because you're seen as a, um, you know, a, a punishment from God. 
um, in in certain countries. And I talk about European countries, you know, actually, because before we went to Seoul, we had all these warnings about, you know, what it was going to be like, um, you know, and, and potential hazards of the streets and people being really kind of unnecessary. And actually, we didn't experience any of that Korea apps or certainly South Korea. And you're nodding because you've been there, I guess, totally embraced the whole Paralympic stuff and, um, you know, just went from a, a, a city that wasn't particularly accessible when the kind of team started arriving to um, uh, totally transforming itself in about three days because they went, well, there's 3000 people who are wheelchair users and or whatever arriving they've got money, they've got dollars, because that's what they're bringing, see them, they see their economic value. And 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 actually, I think that's perfectly fine. I want yeah, my economic, that's... my economic value is is utterly um, important. Well, let's go on to talk about that. We'll flag up though, what else we've got coming up at half past three or soon afterwards we will be moving on to something for the weekend where we look at everything that's available online this weekend before that we have a video about our join in from home program of which this is part we've got sing along with glory sango but first we're going to have a bit more of a chat i have to say vera lynn passed away well, Vera Lynn, we know, has passed away, but Vera Lynn was buried today. She was a local East Ham girl. You would think she was from Sussex for all the publicity, but no, she grew up in East Ham. She went to school in East Ham, and I think at the time she was making the films and singing for the troops, she was very much recognisable as an East Ham girl. So we just wanted to say a thank you, Vera. Rest in peace. Did you have anything to add to that, Julie? Um, not really. I, I think her contribution to the country is unique, um, partly because of her longevity. Being 103 years old is, a, is, an, is an awful lot of years to pack in. Um, but I'm, in a way, I'm quite pleased to say goodbye to her now. Um, and I'll tell you for why. I know that sounds strange. I, I loved her contribution to a whole lot of things that happened during the war, post-war, and over the time commemorating those who we lost. But I think it's the 21st century. We do need to move on a little bit. I don't want to ever forget what happened because it was so wrong. But at the same time, there's, I think, a, a group of people who hold on almost religiously to a sense of Britishness, which isn't really particularly relevant in this day and age. And I think she's been an icon for some of them. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm trying very hard to find the right words, not to be rude at all about Dame Vera Lynn, but I do think times move on. Well, certainly ideas of cultures moving on and people looking back when they certainly need to look forward. But I think it's also great to see how important artists can be yes. in terms of the sort of life of a country over such a long period. And first and foremost, to me, Vera Lynn is a local artist from East yes. Ham who lived a very long, very productive and very influential life, even though she was, quote, just a singer. So the government have announced yesterday, slightly short notice, that as of tomorrow, we can have outdoor performances again, including people singing, as long as they're socially distanced. We've also got news, which my family of swimmers in the West Midlands will be delighted about, about the opening of swimming pools. And the two of them have actually got quite a lot in common. Partly the confusion around what this is actually going to look like. So I don't know whether you want to just update us a bit about the swimming pools, Robin, and then we'll talk about the two things together. Yeah, I'll start and I'll let Josh come in on it because um, he kind of, you know, um, brought me back to gr life, back to ground on it, if you like, um, kind of demonstrating that we do live in a new era of opaque governance. Um, <laughs> I think it's a new era. Of, uh... <laughs> anyway, um, so 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 fundamentally, the headline news is that outdoor swimming pools can open from tomorrow, 
um, and indoor swimming pools and gyms sports and halls. sports halls and stuff can reopen after the 25th of July. I think it's after, not on. But um, what what Josh will come on to tell you is that them saying they can open and then what can necessarily happen in them are two very different things looking at the guidance. So over to you, Josh. Yeah, it's... So they've said that they can open, and that, that's great. Um, and Swim England has put out all of their guidance on how many swimmers you can have per lane, depending on the kind of square footage or square meterage of the lane and all sorts of things. And you can calculate, oh, you can have 36 swimmers. Um, but what hasn't actually changed is that you can only do uh, six people. In, in, in terms of kind of group activities and group exercise um, that came in on the 14th of May, I think, when they started relaxing kind of lockdown rules um, for exercise. So everyone's kind of taken this, oh, gyms are open, sports halls are open, let's run with it. But actually the guidance that you can still only have six people hasn't changed. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see how that actually uh, develops. I suppose it's a similar thing for the performances as well. But do you think they're assuming that it's like shops or schools where it's one metre plus? Or Well, there is there is a um, literally a calculation in terms of, it, yeah, I mean, and they kind of contradict because the guidance that's come out from Swim England, which all swimming clubs and sports centres with swimming pools will be um, using as their guide, is that you need six... Six, six, meters six meters squared surface area per swimmer in a pool. So as a club, we've been really, really proactive. We've measured the lanes, measured, you know, calculated that surface area and calculated how many swimmers we can have in the space that we've got. And actually then, then, then drop that number a little bit because we could have 13.7 swimmers. And I know that there we have Paralympic swimmers in there, but I'm not sure that kind of really works. Um, but, but you know, we dropped it to 10, possibly 11, to, to just add that little bit of additional kind of safety margin on it. Um, the, the venue that we're going to use have done loads of work, created their own videos on how we're going to use it, how to operate. So, you know, one 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 way systems around this chain, around the pool areas, the decking, no use of change, like kind of whole loads of stuff. So really, really proactive stuff to be ready to go. So yeah, they said 25th. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. When can we open as soon as that finishes? But then Swim England treated this morning and that's kind of made, made everyone go, oh, crikey. But yes, the guidelines for six people, including the coach, are still in place. So we were looking at having 20 swimmers in two lane so two sets of 10 swimmers and two coaches um and and that's that, not, that's that yeah gonna that, that's not gonna i mean we could still do exactly what we planned with five swimmers and a coach but it just doesn't make it viable because we'd have to run 40 sessions a week instead of 15 or whatever it is and one of the questions, and I'm going to come on and sort of bring in the government's outdoor performance guidelines in a minute. But one of my concerns with all of this is, are disabled people going to be squeezed out? It's quite, I don't mean in a sort of proper para setting, although even then, you know, if like you say, if you can only take six people and not 10, the four people who are struggling the most are the four people, four people who are going to be dropped. And I think in many situations, it's the person who's got limited mobility, limited eyesight, you know, even limited hearing, who's probably going to be down the bottom of that list in terms of just turfing people out. Or indeed, in terms of risk assessments, well, suddenly you can't see if there's a danger sign coming up or you can't hear if somebody's calling out that somebody's too close. Does that mean that you're not going to be included? The government, in terms of outdoor performances, which can actually start from tomorrow, you know, although the Globe, for one, have said, well, that's just not economic for us. They just talk about socially distanced audiences, which you assume means one metre plus with masks when they're going through things like corridors and probably putting each group 
two meters apart but there's no specifics at all what does concern me is the fact that it says everything's going to have to be e-booked so they can do test and trace because as we've often discussed many many disabled and older people don't have the digital access that they would need to do e-bookings so we've already got concerns around the shielding community like ourselves are not going to be going to the theatre anytime soon, although we would love to see live streaming. But there's a whole other audience that I think would like to go, but just, you know, if you have socially distanced seats, the ticket prices are going to go up. That's a barrier for older and disabled people. You know, if you've got to book online, it's a barrier. It, it just worries me that on top of us being forced to take shelter for much longer than the rest of the population, the world we come back into is not one that's taken the Equality Act into account. Because if you were going to have the Equality Act, you couldn't insist on e-booking because it would be a reasonable adjustment to allow people to call in by phone or even to book by post. So there doesn't seem to me to be the Equality Act embedded in these guidelines at all. I don't know what you think, Julie. I haven't really thought it through very much other than to be very surprised that this opportunity to completely revamp and and change the face of theatre and public performances doesn't appear to be taken seriously. I think three months worth of, of virtual streaming of people extending their skills and and doing something differently, I, I would have hoped would at least be a starting point for a lot of discussions about how um, the, you know, theatres, um, orchestras, the whole performance thing actually progressed. This is, a, this is an opportunity for change and I'm dis... I believe Drew and Julie have frozen slightly. Um, so hopefully you can still hear us. Um, Julia, drop us a message if you can, um, but we'll kind of pick up um, with what they were talking around kind of outdoor performances and things. I mean, you're a musician. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, I, I mean, obviously, we'd love to be getting out there and doing some kind of performance. I mean, as, as a solo artist, actually, the social distancing is quite easy because um, you know, I can be at where we've got to perform from and make sure <laughs> people stay away. And that's if anyone comes to listen to me, obviously. <laughs> um, it's easy to socially distance if no one's there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I understand what Julie's saying is it is quite difficult to imagine how it's going to happen, how it can be economically viable um, if, if, you know, because so many places do need to make a profit out of what they're doing. Um, I mean, in terms of sport and swimming, particularly, you know, I think where swimmers are in sports clubs already, then, you know, they will get, I would hope very much that they would be included in the same way as they already are and would be offered a, a as many sessions as their peers would be. So, for you know, as a club, we aren't we aren't going back to a full program. We're going back to offering two or three sessions a week, depending on ability, and that's changed from either four, five, six, or even eight, depending on what squad people are in. But absolutely ensuring that we do treat people equally. Yeah, I mean, you know, ho hopefully for kind of for those people or power athletes or artists or whoever they are that are within setups prior to, to lockdown and hopefully those adjustments can be made. I think where it might be difficult is people that kind of weren't in those previously wanting to get involved in something. That might be where there'd be potential issues. But again, you know, hopefully with you know the whatever you're trying to join is you know, communicates with you and you communicate with them and that you know something can be can be set up um to to kind of allow you to to participate obviously with, with sport that's more complex but you know i think like julie was saying there's there's been so much done over the last few months on live streaming events and 
regardless of what they are, whether it's you know theatre shows or live music performances or, or or whatever, that actually, you know, hope hopefully that does continue. I and mean, we have talked about it previously. Of you know, once lockdown is, is over, whatever that might be, you know, hopefully it's not. All right, cool. We can forget about that online stuff. And yeah, no, we, we just go back to being in. But you know, hope, yeah. hopefully it it does continue, and you know, there may well be a a paywall in, in in the future for that um in, in that you have to buy a virtual ticket um you know that that may well be the the case um, and certainly for kind of you know lots of things around theatre struggling and being able to kind of open in a in a way that is economically viable um but yeah hopefully kind of that that doesn't just get well, lost well no i mean i i think you're absolutely right and um, and in in fact, if venues or whatever it is that that are um, staging live performances do take on board the idea that they can continue to offer performances that are both live in terms of being in an audience, but at a much less cost, but still a cost, be able to produce you know put shows online but actually then they can sell it to far far more people yeah um, it's it's not a new concept particularly if you look at um kind of sport you know box, yeah boxing, boxing bo- and, yeah, yeah you know things like that have have you know paper pay- number as pay-per-view events a year um you know and, and tickets to be there in person can range from you know probably 50 pound to you know, thousands of pounds, or you know, it's twenty five pounds or whatever. And you can watch it on Sky Sports or or whatever. You know, what? Why can't that model be applied to the arts? Ah, oh, here we are. I don't know what happened to us. Um, I suspect it was the same contractor who switched off the entire power to the street yesterday for two minutes. But <laughs> we've had no internet at all. I'm delighted to see, considering my computer hasn't been working and I'm engineering it, that you're still on air, which is great. Um, what I think we'll probably do is drop uh, join in on Friday's film so we can get back on schedule. But what were you just talking about, Josh, in terms of that being a model for the arts? It sounded really interesting. Yeah, we were just kind of continuing the conversation that we were, we were already in, but we we're talking about, you know, continuing live streaming for, for shows and things when they come back on. That, you know, sport has been doing that for years with kind of pay-per-view events where you buy a virtual ticket and watch it online. You know, if you can't yeah. get there in person or can't afford it. And I don't think there's any reason why you know that that model can't literally just be lifted out of the sports sector dropped into yeah. art or, very, or whatever yeah i um, feel very strongly that well two things about theaters one is that if it's a theater that's incredibly inaccessible for both the audience and the workers let it close down the idea that we're going to prop up every single theatre, however unsuccessful, just seems to me to be ridiculous. But the other thing, absolutely, they used to refer to the seats at the top being the gods. They were always the very, very cheap seats with a very restricted view. And I don't see why a digital audience shouldn't be like the equivalent of the gods that you sell tickets to every performance, there's a restricted number, the price is cheaper. These days, I believe there is a system where you can have a number of fixed cameras in a theatre and you, the viewer, can actually mix your own feed. So that just seems to me to be the obvious thing to do. I think the concern for me as a director is how you safely rehearse and safely put people on stage where social distancing isn't possible. But the idea that you're kind of not prepared to cater for audience members who are never going to be able to get to the West End or the centre of Bristol or indeed Southampton, you know, which very sadly has lost all three of its theatres. And that's certainly not something that I'm happy to see. I think Southampton were doing a very, very good job. And probably that's why they had fewer reserves, because they were better at doing inclusion. But yes, we should certainly be working towards a much more inclusive much safer society and not going backwards and excluding people. I think there's one thing that this has really shown is that, 
you know, we're all dependent on people who have quite low incomes and we're all one community. I think there was an idea beforehand that maybe disabled people and older people didn't matter that much. And one of the great, I think, bonuses of lockdown is that we have been recognised as being important. And um, yes, we have. At least we've been mentioned, we've been included. <laughs> people have cared. So um, on that happy note, I suggest we have a sing-along on a Friday, we have our usual music club. We will be finishing today with a song from Robin. This is Glory Sango and our associate drama company, Act Up Newham. It's a video called Songs We Sing at Home. It's a song from the Congo by a Congolese artist called Kofi, I think, Olamide. The words are up, I think, possibly slightly more phonetically spelt. We would usually switch our microphones off, and that might be a good thing to do because otherwise the video will reverb. So we will all be joining in from home completely silently as far as anybody else is concerned. So this is an opportunity to sing your heart out and to get rid of all that Friday frustration. Her, her ladies and gentlemen at home, I'm going to teach you a Congolese song of Gofium this Steffi. Then I'm going to sing the first verse, then you sing it to me back, all right? Steffi, okay, okay, sing it with me. Steffi, Steffi's on the Zumbi. Steffi, Steffi's on the Steffi na no motema. Steffi na no motema. Na we na i molei. Na we na i molei. Steffi akai akai. Steffi zonga zongai. Steffi na no motema. Na we na i molei. Then you sing it to me back, all right? Well done, ladies and gentlemen at home. You're very good at singing. So did you sing along at home like we did? We yes. enjoyed that, didn't Very we? Much. <laughs> we did indeed. I'm not sure our timing was quite right. <laughs> no, I'm not sure any of our timing was quite right. I'm not 100% convinced the timing was quite right on that video. I would have liked it to have come in a bit quicker or not to let the words disappear. But we'll try that again at some point in the future. So, something for the weekend, which now will include potentially outdoor performances and drive-through cinemas, which is the other thing that's... And drive-through comedy. I see Eddie Izzard is now selling tickets. Have you come across this in the West Midlands? I think the big London drive-in comedy has been set up outside um, Brent Cross Shopping Centre. And it looks like it operates on shortwave. So you have the performer on these huge screens, like a cinema drive-in, but then you can tune in on your radio to get the set. And you're allowed yeah. to get out of the car and have a picnic and use a portable radio, but you have to be distanced from the next car. And I mean, comedy is one of those things that I think is really very difficult to do just as a stream. Not as difficult as live music and certainly not as difficult as dance. I, I think the kind of nightclubs have been so left out of all of these rescue packages. And yet you can't run a socially distanced nightclub. You can't really stream a nightclub. 
and that nightlife is so important to so many people particularly if you come from if you like a minority group and going out on a Friday or a Saturday night is your opportunity to get together with people like you I think that is very difficult but I like the idea of the driving comedy I think where it falls down is what we were talking about earlier in the week which is how do you go to the toilet yeah <laughs> I think I mean I uh, in fact, Tracy and I were just talking before the show when we were looking at that stuff about the weekend. So the NEC, um, which is a huge exhibition centre just outside it's Birmingham, the national exhibition. It is. Centers. Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, have have set up um, a, a driving film, you know, driving cinema. But she was telling me it's thirty eight pounds a car. Oh. Which is really That's a lot of money. Steep. <laughs> and 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 she's saying you know they're not even new films um it's like it's like the lion king um so very sing-alongy kind of stuff actually greece but i mean i wouldn't pay three pound 80 to watch greece again let alone 38 quid <laughs> well of course we are all supposed to be contributing to the economy if we've got money we're supposed to be spending it but cinemas in london are certainly very 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 expensive we barely go i mean we've yeah, I think it's true to say we've actually really benefited from the fact that new films are now coming out and are available to pay to watch online because it's great to be able to watch a film then and not pay to watch it online 18 months later. But, um, I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? What do you think, Julie? My experience of driving movies goes back to the 50s, so I can't help but be influenced by by the professionalism that was around at that time. There were speakers on wires that went into the, um, the passengers' windows of all the, the vehicles, and it tended to take place in a field. So <laughs> sort of like, I'm sorry, Brent Cross doesn't really do it for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and I, I, I totally agree that we should be spending money where we can, but um, at the same time, I've noticed, because we've been having to check, um that shopping has gone up yeah quite a lot i couldn't put a percentage on it but i we're, we're probably spending 30 percent more a week on just ordinary foods without going out and stuff like that is that because i'm here no no I mean, <laughs> well yes so that makes it 100 more. But... <laughs> yes that might have something to do with it but yes i mean and i think that's the reality you know we we have a recession. We know the country is going to be very badly hit by the failure to act more quickly at the start. On the other hand, we're artists. We want to support the arts. The film cinema employs an awful lot of actors and directors and set designers and costume maker and makeup artists. So in general, I think it's a good thing. But like you say, I still come back to that very practical. What happens if you need to go to the loo? Really, they need to have those kind of self-cleaning toilets. I've been surprised that... Back in the sort of late 70s, early 80s, I was briefly a nanny in Paris. And even then, they had these automatic mm. toilets where afterwards the whole thing just cleaned itself. And I've been really surprised that they haven't had more of them. They brought them onto the streets in London and then they just stopped providing public toilets full stop. And I think that's where the problems came. it was it was uh because of bombs wasn't it i think that that was the thing is that um because it was so easy to leave a bomb in something like that it was it, a lot of things like the litter bins went as well but the reality is that there are already self-cleaning public toilets around yeah, and if yeah. only they would start putting those in then i think you really kind of motivate yeah. ha -ha. i mean it reminds me when when we went i mean so when we went to seoul for the paralympics that was the first time i experienced um self flushing everything and taps that you only had to look at kind of wave your hand close to and they came on and stuff but then they kind of went a bit too far whereas for example there's a um a, a entertainment place called star city um that's that's just just off spaghetti junction and, and they're not there now, but at one point they actually had like LCD TV screens built into the 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 wet area of the urinal, so that if you couldn't possibly miss something other than perhaps the urinal, you were 
you, you, you know, you could go and have a wee and watch telly at the same time. Great. I mean, yeah, you, obviously useful. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be the absolute ideal for a drive-in, I'm sure. You know, self-cleaning, <laughs> self fucking yeah. that also had the movie. But I think I would just settle for some kind of hygienic provision and say performances. Yeah. And that's the reality, you know, if theatres choose to start streaming, and it is a choice, then they will have a lot of people like us who can never go, not least because of the lack of parking, the lack of access and the ticket prices. And we will be extremely pleased to buy tickets and support you. I want, I want to just pop in here because I think Robin's point was a good one about there just isn't the money around. There's money around for some people who've been on guaranteed wages and usually they're the higher paid but so many people have lost their jobs and so many people you know are having real problems with their housing um, and the expenses that have come over the last three months including as Robin quite rightly said the increase in the price of food it worries me when we have the, the grand reopenings of this, that and the other, that disabled people, again, are going to be squeezed out because we're going to be seen as expensive because the money just isn't there to accommodate reasonable access. Well, thank goodness, I can say, for the success of campaigns like We Shall Not Be Removed, which we flagged up a couple of weeks ago. There's certainly task groups from every area of the arts working with these government task forces to try and ensure that people remember that disabled people exist, are important and also legally have to be included. And that, I think, is what I'm missing from some mm -hmm. of the official guidance, not just in terms of disabled people, but how it can affect all sorts of different groups. And I think different policies affect different groups. And we're probably not half as aware of we as we should be of how they affect people of colour. So what are your recommendations for the weekend, boys? If I can call you that. Boys. Get away with it. <laughs> Probably um, I can because we're locked in for months. Laddie, so my get... boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheating slightly in that actually most of my, or all of my recommendations for this weekend are the same as my recommendations for last weekend. Um, Firstly, uh, there's another F1 race um, this weekend, and it is in Austria again. Um, if it's about half as good as last weekend's race, it's going to be a cracker. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight, um, you were talking about it at the start of the show, around kind of the end racism and, and the campaigns that, that Lewis Hamilton specifically is doing, um, but that F1 have kind of got behind. Um, the, the Channel 4 coverage of the race last weekend and um, I thought did a really really good job of talking about the end racism campaign talking about the work that Lewis Hamilton's been doing um, but they brought they also brought in um, Lee McKenzie who's a Formula One journalist and the host of the W series which is the women's only F1 um, and they brought in Billy Munger as well who's a racing driver that um, lost both of his legs in a crash and is now back racing but does a lot of presenting for Channel 4. Um, they brought both of them in as well to talk about um, women and disability in, in motorsport, but in general. I think uh, you're going to talk about it as well a little bit, but the, I think their coverage of it was really, really well done. Um, yeah, no, I, I, it's a really naturalistic cover as well. It was just, it was just brought through as an extension of what Black Lives Matter. Well, actually, without it coming across wrong, every life matters, and 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 doing it in a way that was just, it was just well, like we've talked about, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, then moved it into a broader racist racism discussion, and then brought it into you know women in sport and kind of a lot of the stuff around women engineers and then as female Josh said, drivers yeah as well. female racing drivers and then of course uh, um you know a, a a good mention from i mean billy munger's quite good at presenting considering he's so young and what he's been through um and to, I to get yeah, I was going to say because, of course, the Every Life Matters has is very much a kind of slogan of the racists. Yeah, that's we have to be really careful. Intersectionality <laughs> is absolutely critical, and where they need to kind of move on is to say, well, 
you don't look at people of colour over here and women here and disabled people here. You have to go, there are disabled women of colour. Yeah. You know, that's the reality, you know, and those are the people you absolutely don't want to miss. You don't want to have a campaign that ignores the things that specifically impact. I mean, men, you know, well, we could even begin a kind of big count but there's there's so many kind of areas where people of color are more affected in terms of disability and also huge issues for women of color that you know white women just don't have to deal with we're gonna give you an update next week on our young black lives matter campaign at which point we do hope that the mayor of newham will have finally responded what else were you going to recommend for the weekend robin and then, yeah, the other thing we were going to talk about was um, was Wimbledon. Um, I think currently on TV now, but don't switch either just yet, um, is is the replays from uh, or the highlights of the men's and women's final, a uh, singles final from last year, um, which were both kind of record-breaking finals. Um, the women's final was a great match. Yeah. Um, the, the men's final was one of the best games of tennis I've ever seen. Um, it was absolutely incredible. I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but it will be on iPlayer later. Go and watch it. Um, if you like tennis, really, if you don't like tennis, I'd still recommend it. This right. was a good time to just put Judy's little Wimbledon clip on. We were talking last week and again this week on Monday when we were talking about film techniques, about making films with stills and music. And then we talked a lot in earlier in the week about the difficulties of getting them off the iPad. This is actually a clip from a longer film Julie had made, but same principle, which is some of her Wimbledon memories. is continuing (laughs) (laughs) yes lovely stirring music judy so that was some of your memories of wimbledon my something for the weekend of course is the wild festival i felt this top would suffice for me to go to wimbledon and the wild festival the wild festival is a disability arts live stream that starts tomorrow from i believe three o'clock We'll have all of the details on our highlights and links page as usual. That's just on the main website, www.together2012.org.uk. Underneath the Together Unlocked TV main link, it's also linked from that page. And our Join In From Home programme has unsurprisingly a big link called Join In From Home. And there's a very full programme of accessible, inclusive activities that you can do almost entirely with things that you will already have at home. Did we have any more tips for something for the weekend? I, I just think very, very quickly to pick up Josh's point about Formula One. 
it's the weather's going to be dire. It's going to be absolutely appalling. So it'll be very, very exciting at the Red Bull Ring in um, Spielberg. Uh, I would keep an ear out. I'm going to be listening on the uh, on the radio, the BBC coverage. Is that the free coverage? I was going to say, yes. how do you get to see Formula One for nothing? Well, as it what were? Josh was saying as well is a free coverage. The 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 Channel Four highlights, isn't it, Josh? Yes, yeah, the Channel Four ones. There's highlights on Saturday and Sunday for qualifying and then the race. And do you know what time that is? Ooh, it will be around six, seven o'clock typically. Um, I don't know the exact times, but it'll be around kind of half six, seven o'clock. And I've got a couple of things for the weekend just to be a bit different. Um, Josh has previously mentioned the Andrew Lloyd Webber stuff and the musical that they're releasing this week is Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, um, I think today actually. Uh, then there is something called the Stonehaven Folk Festival. Again, the, the, the links for all of these will be on the website. Um, but we haven't talked very much about folk. Um, and so I just thought that something a bit different. And having looked at the website, there are kind of workshops and arty stuff going on as well within that one. Um, and, and, and again, kind of linking it to some of the stuff we do um, with the hand puppets in particular. This weekend is the last weekend of the Beverly Puppet Festival, and they have kind of puppet fe- puppet performances online all weekend. Well, that sounds fabulous. I've missed both of those. We would have had a lot more folk content if it wasn't for coronavirus, and then, of course, we wouldn't have had this live stream because our associate wheelchair dance company, Folk in Motion, We looked a little bit at their work last month, but Julie and I were supposed to be on a folk festival tour at the moment. So I think it would have been pretty much finishing because the festivals would have already taken place. But we were touring because Folk in Motion had been invited to perform at these different festivals and we were going to work out whether that was practical and possible. All of them were cancelled, so I'm just thrilled to know that there's one that has remained online. I think they cancelled because because they do fall at the beginning of the summer. It was already too late in March to be able to look at what they could do differently. So what's the name of the one that's on again online, Robin? Stonehaven. Stonehaven. And for the Andrew Lloyd Webber, can you remind me again, they're re- they've got their own website and they're releasing a recording of a musical each week. Is that correct? Yeah, that is that is correct. And I, the, the, the link of shows must go on, I believe, on YouTube. Yeah. And I, I put the link to that, which will then take you to whatever I think is on any given week. Brilliant. So I will be getting that links page up as soon as I possibly can. We put the recording of this show onto the website and onto YouTube by eight o'clock. That's just had the audio tidied up a little bit and the the captions that we were streaming underneath on the website at the moment will be embedded. If you are watching this show on YouTube and you're watching it live, and you do need captions, then those are displayed as we stream on our website, www.together2012.org.uk. So next week, we have an exciting week coming up. I'm just going to mute your microphone for a moment. That's the power I've got. So you can plug your guitar in. Thumbs up. Right, let's take that mic back off mute again. So exciting week next week, Ju, um, and I'll say goodbye. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you on Monday and indeed Wednesday and Friday from 3 to 4 o'clock. The recordings go up in the evening. They stay online permanently. Otherwise, it's enjoy Wimbledon, Stonehaven Folk Festival, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Formula One, and in particular, our very own Wild Festival. We'll say goodbye from East London, and we'll hand over to the West Midlands for some goodbyes and a final song from Robin Surgener, also known as Angry Fish. So it's goodbye from East London. And it's goodbye from me. I hope you all enjoy your weekend. Lovely, thank you. One, two. Okay, so hi guys. Um, this the song today is called "The Tale of Basement Billy."
There goes Billy walking down the street, feeling kind of cool, got a beat to his feet. He might be leaning slightly, got cerebral palsy, but his character is lively and his attitude ballsy. There goes Billy walking down the street. He hasn't got a clue of the fate he's about to meet. He's got an Atos test, which really shouldn't phase you, but he don't realize they're trying to euthanasia. Here comes Billy walking back up the street. His face is downturned, hides an image of defeat. Just an hour ago he had no real cares, now he's burdened with fear and burdened with despair. Government cleansing, frightening and menacing, bullying the weak and oppressing the innocent, rich cats, brick bats, firing poison bullets at the poor and the needy with no defence from these attacks. As Billy passes by, he's no longer relaxed. His benefits are cut and he owes the bedroom tax. If kids have grown up and left his adapted home, leaving him and his wife to live in three rooms on their own. There's no need to wonder why Billy was incarcerated for his own protection was how it was deliberated. They put him in a six by five, said it would keep him alive. They pumped him full of drugs. Now his brain is fully fried. They put him in a six by five, said it would keep him alive. They pumped him full of drugs. Now his brain is fully fried. It's government cleansing, frightening and menacing, bullying the weak and oppressing the innocent. Rich cats, brick bats. Firing poison bullets at the poor and the needy with no defence from these attacks. I said, bite me, fight me, you'll never undermine me. Lies wrecked down the deck, you can't take away your self-respect. Hysterically, medically, challenges with austerity. Stick a finger to the city, stick with us and diss the pity. Stick a finger to the city with us and diss the pity. Stick a finger to the city, stick with us and diss the pity. Stick a finger to the city with us and diss the pity. Stick a finger to the city, stick with us and diss the pity. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye.